Stress is the inflammation that robs us of life, energy, and happiness. Our typical solutions for gut health and hormone balance have let a lot of us down. We're over-medicated and underserved. At The Less Stressed Life, we're a community of health-savvy women exploring solutions outside of our traditional Western medicine toolbox and training to raise the bar and change our stories. Each week, our hope is that you leave our sessions inspired to learn, grow, and share these stories to raise the bar in your life and home. Eight years ago, my husband lost his health insurance and I was self-employed. I'd been working in conventional care up to that point in my career, and I was seeing gross mismanagement of the healthcare industry daily. The company I worked for was amazing, but the reasons we were treating the patients were completely preventable, and our small facility created about a million dollars per month in healthcare system burden due to these mostly preventable diseases. My nurse friends also shared stories with me of people faking chest pain for an ambulance ride just to get cigarettes. I did not want to be part of this broken model, and it weighed heavily on my heart. While frantically searching for options to my healthcare dilemma, I found Christian Healthcare Ministries, or CHM, which would allow me to submit medical bills for cost-sharing and reimbursement. CHM is a member-based nonprofit ministry, and it's shared 100% of eligible medical bills for members since 1981. I've been a CHM member over eight years, and I love that it provides a healthcare solution for my entire family that's budget-friendly while also sharing the same values that include prevention and healing. I know where my healthcare dollars are going and who they are supporting, and I even have the option for maternity cost sharing. With the money that I've saved being a CHM member over the years, I've also been able to allocate our healthcare dollars where they matter most to my family. If you want to learn more about whether CHM could be a solution for you, there's a link in the show notes for getting more information, or you can go to chministries.org forward slash less stressed life. That's chministries.org forward slash less stressed life. When you use that link, it really helps them know if you heard the podcast. And I hope that my story is helpful to you in case you are in need of a healthcare solution. Today on The Less Stress Life, I'm joined by Dr. Jabin Moore, who's a doctor of chiropractic located in Kansas City, who works virtually with clients through functional medicine to assist them in overcoming chronic health conditions. At the age of 25, he went from being an award-winning college athlete to not being able to get out of bed. He sought out countless doctors looking for answers, but doctors only gave him Band-Aid solutions. He was later diagnosed with Lyme disease. Once he overcame this complex infection, he dedicated his practice to helping clients discover the root causes of their symptoms. And now he specializes in Lyme disease, pans and pandas, autism, parasitic infections, and environmental toxicities. His team at the Redefining Wellness Center sees clients virtually. And today we're talking about some of these topics. I was just telling you about how well the parasite conversation went over somewhat recently. And then I recall right now that I've had Dr. Emily Gutierrez on a few times now, but she did a pans and pandas once. I don't know if you know her. She's out of Texas. I don't think so. No. no I look her up. A- just a small world. She was just such a gem in this area. So thanks for coming on today. Your story is very dramatic and very good. Will you tell us how long it kind of seemed to take or some of the degradation between being this college athlete to all of a sudden not being able to function? How long did that actually take? Tell us about how that transpired a little bit. There was a little bit of a buildup. I can remember going and just starting to have a sore throat in college yeah, and not really understanding true. why. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't a drinker. I didn't party. I was an athlete. I'm five foot 10. So I wasn't big enough to not mm-hmm. give it everything and eat right. So mm-hmm. I remember the sore throat. And I remember not really getting stronger in college. And I just didn't really develop like I thought I would out of high school. And then when I graduated from college, I really started to notice a lot of symptoms coming on more fatigue, more brain fog. My joints started hurting. My hormones, I think, were starting to crash. I didn't wasn't testing at the time. I was going to chiropractic school and I ended up with erectile dysfunction, which at 25 is it's a tough road to try to accept, especially when doctors keep telling you it just happens. I'm like, I'm super healthy. I do everything I can think of right. Mm-hmm. And you're telling me this just happens to some people and you got this little pill they'll give you to fix it. I was like, no, that's not, I'm not accepting this. So I went from doctor to doctor, functional 
alternative doctors, natural doctors, medical doctors. And even in the functional realm, I kept getting, well, just take this supplement and it'll just band-aid it. And I was like, I don't want a band-aid. I want a solution. Why? So it took a couple of years to really hit the bottom of health for me. And I was going from conference to conference asking questions. And somebody's like, well, do you have Lyme disease? Like, have you thought of that? And I go, no, tell me more. Because that wasn't exactly a topic more than a decade ago that was as popular to talk about. We didn't have as much social media to just throw it out there in front of you. So I asked him like, well, what do you know about it? How can I help? And he said, I don't really know. But there's this guy in Wisconsin. So went up to Dr. Lindsley and he was able to help me get back on my feet, get well. And it's been my mission since to not just with Lyme disease, but with the crazy mystery symptom stuff to find answers. When people come in with autoimmune diseases, with pants, pandas, with autism, with eczema, it's like, let's find like why behind all of this to give you an answer. It's usually not one thing. So it's not just Lyme or just parasites. It's usually a conglomerate of different things that lead down this path and people will miss one of those things and just not be able to get well. So I've been able to create a really systematic approach with even within my notes so that my docs in my own clinic can reproduce it because it makes you ask all these questions of the things that are always missed mm. to try and put it together so that people are able to get to the bottom of their situation. How far along in chiropractic school were you? I'm glad you were in chiropractic school, I think, and not in MD school just because, and I can't speak intelligently to how that looks, but I've got a family member in MD school right now and health is just not at the top of what's happening when they are going to school, right? It's like stupid hours and whatnot. Whereas usually kind of more in chiropractic, it's a little more holistically focused. So how far along were you and how long did it take you to get back on your feet? The crash really started happening more toward the end. So I was about year three, three and a half when I was really hitting the rock bottom of my symptoms. And once I got to Dr. Lindsay, I actually recovered fairly quickly, but, which is not the common story amongst most yeah. of my clients, but it was only a few months and I started feeling some really significant differences. Got back to what I thought was normal within probably six months. And then as my journey has gone on, I've learned more about mold and metals and other things that I've continued to improve upon what I thought was health. Mm -hmm. Because I remember doing a heavy metal protocol and all of a sudden I lost my voice again and I got dark mm -hmm. bags under my eyes. And I was like, I was having such a bad detox reaction. I didn't even know that that was a problem for me at the time. But we all learned our lessons as I continued going to more classes totally. and more training. But uh, as far as the chiropractic school, we took 30 credit hours a semester, year round, three semesters a year. So I'm not sure how holistically focused it was. Sure. I got you. I wonder if you recovered quickly because your overall duration of illness was not super duper duper long. I feel like if you've been sick for a few years versus 10 plus, I think I always feel like if it's been over a decade, it may take a little bit longer than if it's less than a few years. Do you have any thoughts on like why you got better versus some of your clients? I have lots of thoughts on this. There's a few things that I found. Higher testosterone level individuals mm -hmm. tend to have more anabolics or like building block type hormones. Mm -hmm. So we tend to see them recover a little bit more easily in most cases. Even a lot of larger, more muscular men don't feel their symptoms for years until it breaks them down and then they're not mm -hmm. larger and more muscular anymore. Mm -hmm. So I've seen that be a part of it. I always wanted to keep moving and I know it's just not a part in my brain that works. So I didn't have a give up or a quit that was there. And it was, I don't care what it takes, which a lot of my clients have that too. So that is actually more common than some of the other parts. Genetics play a role. So you methylate well, are you able to pull in the appropriate nutrients to heal your body? Well, I don't think my epigenetics were turned on, which duration does affect that. Like you were saying, and then just mindset. So. Whether it was the fact that I was an athlete and I developed this mindset from that or the way that my dad just lives his life, which is you just keep moving forward and you don't let the crap bother you that you can't control. That type of mindset, non-perfectionistic mindset, which I've, in the mass cell communities, the really chronic communities, you get to the state of fight or flight, which makes you a little more OCD, a little bit more anxious and perfectionistic because you think you have to do everything exactly the way it's supposed to, to get well because you haven't been able to get there. So. I never got to that point within my mentality. What I tell people is if you're so focused on being perfect all the time or OCD or anxious all the time, your body is burning a lot of energy in that and not burning the energy on healing. 
So I spend a lot of time focusing with chronic male people on getting out of fight or flight, mm -hmm. which sometimes is just the way that you perceive the world. Right. And it may be that way because of the chronic illness, but all of those play a role. And I think I just had a blessing of an upbringing that didn't allow me to get stuck within some of those stumbling blocks. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Perfectionism can be a real killer to progress for sure. I want to ask you, you found out you had Lyme. I think you found out officially you had Lyme, right? When you went up mm -hmm. to see your doctor, you mentioned having erectile dysfunction and that was kind of like, there's a, always a straw that breaks the camel's back. Obviously not getting out of bed is a pretty big problem, but you were kind of like perplexed by not being able to get stronger, et cetera, like you thought you should, right? It's like, I'm doing mm -hmm. this work and not getting where I am. So what I'm kind of hearing, which is fun, is sometimes we have these over, these symptoms expressing like erectile dysfunction that we wouldn't think about what they would be related to. So can you talk about mechanisms that you thought were causing the erectile dysfunction of what you were experiencing? Does that make sense? Did I ask that yeah. question properly? Yeah. I mean, at the time, mechanisms I thought was stress from school or something of that nature because I was physically fit. Mm -hmm. Like I had a six pack, like I was built. So I didn't think it was a lack of muscle testosterone or desire. So I was like, oh, it's got to be just stress. Like that's the, what I thought it was. Come to find out with Lyme, you have increased cortisol hormones and stress. And when you are in a state of stress, fight or flight, you're not in a state where your body wants to reproduce. So with women, we're in a lot more dust tests on women and we see progesterone and estrogen just crash when their bodies are really stressed out. Well, when you get rid of that, it goes back to normal. Sex drive goes up. Same thing for men. We just don't run, or at least I don't run as many dust tests on men to see that as often. So for me, it was just a crash. And then uh, vasodilation wasn't as good. So that's why I kept getting told to take nitric oxide and they're like, oh, I'll just take massive doses in the natural side and that'll fix the problem. And I'm like, well, it'll artificially give me the ability to create vasodilation, but which leads to erectile solutions temporarily. But I'm like, that's not what I want. I don't want to have to go, oh, you know, I'm with my wife. I'm going to take nitric oxide now so that I could prepare for later every time. Like it just takes the fun out of life. Right. For sure. Okay. Thanks for sharing that little tidbit on testosterone. Sometimes I think something that can be frustrating for people, and I see this, I work with a lot of skin stuff, so I see a lot of mold, as you do. And mm -hmm. I think something that stinks for people is when they can be living in the same house as their partner and their husband maybe doesn't seem as affected as the wife does, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you see that all the time. So that might be one factor. Genetics are another factor. Anything else you would say as people try to kind of make sense of that in their heads about, hey, why do I live with one person and they're impacted differently than I am? You know, I'm always afraid to bring this topic up here because I feel like I'm going to get bashed by somebody at some point. But in general, the women I talk to versus the men I talk to, the women just worry about things in the world a little more often. Is the house is clean? Are the kids taken care of? What's the plan for tomorrow? The guys are just kind of going through life, a lot of them. And the ones that I meet that are worried about more things tend to be the ones that I'm working with because they're a little sicker. Right. It's less often I get a carefree, happy-go-lucky guy in with these chronic situations. It's not that they can't. It's just, it's a different storm that, that gets them. So with women, oftentimes I'm having these conversations of can you control this thing that's happening in your life right now that's stressing you out? And if they tell me no, I'm like, then you just can't worry about it. Stop spending the energy on that that I could spend on something else. So I think that's a piece of the puzzle because that is a common question I watch in my clinic is, well, I'm sick and my husband's fine, so it can't be our home, right? I'm like, ah, eh, there's a lot of other factors to look at. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so I'd love to get into, I know there's always multi- factorial reasons people have presentation. Something that has come up again and again, and it's been a minute since I've asked a guest about this. I want to talk about terrain theory, right? The mm -hmm. idea of what kind of allows your body, and this might just really piggyback onto the last conversation, what really allows your body to welcome in perhaps <laughs> or be a continuously hospitable environment to some things. Examples. Some people work through gut problems, they treat parasites, et cetera, and they clear up and everything is fine. And then sometimes some people have, they continue to see signs and symptoms. They continue to have those things. They go on good protocol and they struggle to clear that out a little bit. Now that could be the type of organism, but I'd love to talk about terrain and what you think makes up terrain theory or 
in general, the ability for you to either have a thriving environment or being a host to some of these organisms, mold, et cetera. What impacts terrain for us overall? I just made it simple. Everything impacts terrain. Yeah. But we'll, we'll go a little bigger than that. And we just had a massive world event, COVID, that proved this out a little bit, where we saw people that had pre-existing conditions were more likely to have an issue, right? So if your body is less healthy, you're more likely to have an issue. Well, what causes pre-existing conditions in the world that we know about? Diet, lack of exercise, toxins. So things like drinking alcohol or having other toxins like cigarettes going into the body, living in houses that let paint. So those are kind of the commonplace thoughts that are out there when we saw this. But in my own personal experience, when COVID happened, I go, oh crap, I still see people in person. At the time, I saw a lot of people in person. Now I'm mostly virtual. But I was like, I can't get sick because if I get sick, I can't go to work for 10 days or 14 days or whatever it was. So I'm like, I don't have time to have a stuffy nose. Mm -hmm. So I shifted my whole lifestyle. I was like, I'm going to make sure absolutely I get sleep every single night. I'm going to make sure that I'm already eating well, but like I'm going to eat even better. I'm going to make sure to take mitochondrial supplements and I'm going to really put a focus on doing things that calm my nervous system so that I don't use up extra energy and take away from my immune system. I didn't have like a stuffy nose for two straight years because I was focused on that. And let me tell you this, I never stopped traveling. I never stopped going out. I never stopped going around people. I never stopped seeing people in my clinic. So I was around people a lot more than a lot of other people would have been at that time period. So this all fits into ter to terrain because when you take a person and you optimize their body, they tend not to get sick very often. They tend to be pretty well. And I see that within my clients too. Once somebody's been through my care plan and they get well and they're like, hey, I never want to go back and they live a healthy lifestyle. They're like, I don't get sick anymore, like ever. So just looking at the, the world we live in today. I mentioned perfectionism. I've mentioned worry. I've talked about stress in life, right? So all of those things wear you down. The number one thing that makes me sick is I work too much. If I work too much, I will get sick. I just know that. And I watch it come forward. I was actually sneezing a bunch the last couple of days because I had a whole lot of stuff I was getting done for a summit launch. And I was just like, oh, I know what's happening here. Get my adrenal supplement, let myself sleep extra and not sneezing anymore. Because yeah. I allow for my body to calm down, but look at the world we live in. So there's stress everywhere. So then let's look at the food. It's got chemicals and toxins all over it. If you're not eating organically, which is wrecking your microbiome and causing a degradation to your immune system. If your house is full of mold, you probably don't have much of an immune system there, which 50 to 70% of houses that today have a mold toxicity in them. Just look at that up on the EPA. And then we go to the quantities of food that we're eating are likely a lot processed unless you're making a choice and a decision to eat whole food, which takes more effort, which decreases the amount of nutrients in the foods anyway when you process it. But then even your whole foods today are were over farmed and are 40, 50% less nutritious than they were 50, 100 years ago. So we're getting less nutrients into our body that way. So all of these factors weaken your system. And what I tell people is this, they go, hey, Look, just put a backpack on and we're going to go for a walk. And within that, if you have mold in your house, I'm going to put a 45 pound plate in there. If you didn't get enough sleep over the last month and because you're stressed out from work, kids, family, whatever, to a point where it's not no longer something you tolerate well, put another 45 pound plate there. If you have food that is inorganic and you're not getting enough nutrition in, put another 45 pound plate in there. It stacks up really quick. I'm already 135 pounds. How many people listening to this podcast right now would want to take a hike with me with 135 pounds extra on their back? How far are we going to make it? That's your terrain. That's your immune system. How much have you stacked on it? How much is it carrying? Realistically, was it carrying that much? What's your expectation of how well it's going to perform? I love that just because I love using backpacks as a analogy for a toxic burden and a burden in general. I would call a lot of people when I ask them about terrain, they generally summarize it as toxic burden. I think maybe we could have elevated that a bit and called it overall immune burden the way you talked about it because stress yeah. is such an immune burden. And you brought up a topic that I think piggybacks well on this that people ask a lot. So you see mold a lot. I see mold a lot. And it doesn't have to be severe. I like to say 
I love the mild to moderate where people are unstable, but it's just kind of naggingly annoying and being a little more aggressive and needs a little bit more of an aggressive approach. So people will sometimes ask, isn't there kind of mold everywhere? And how am I going to be resilient in the future? Let me give you an example. I've got this girl and she's got a, a mold situation. She'd come from her vacation, started getting sick and kind of everything snowballed from there. And her mom said, but won't there be mold everywhere? What do you say to a question like that? And I think it, it probably is a lot like your terrain answer from a little bit too. It's a hundred percent like that. I would tell the mother, yes, there's mold everywhere, but that doesn't mean there's ban mold everywhere, right? So what we're looking for is certain types of mold. And then the amount of that bad type of mold is important to me. So if I run a dust sample collection and we get back, let's say this is an ERMI, it's, which is a environmental readiness score. And we get back that your Aspergillus pinicoloides is 562. That's way too much. It's a dangerous mold. It's too much of the dangerous mold. If your score came back at 70, most people can tolerate that. So it's what type is it and how much is it is important, right? So if I'm going to buy a new house, go to an apartment, worry about mold, it's about the amounts. And here's the thing that I tell people, if we can monitor the, the amount of actual, like external stress in your life, mental, emotional, make sure that the home that you live in is acceptable, not perfect. And with my clients that are panicked about mold, I'm like, Hey, let's run a test. Let's get it back. And then let's maybe once a year, you could rerun the test. And when you run the test, if it comes back clean, so long as you don't see water damage, your home, it's off your mind. Stop thinking about it. Don't let that worry you. Cause that goes back to the stress component. Yeah. If we're eating the appropriate foods and if we're optimizing the mitochondria, which is your powerhouse, by the way, and I've done this experiment on purpose. If you optimize your mitochondria while still living in a place that's not perfect, not that's like completely overwhelming, but not perfect, it will actually make you tolerate it better because now your body has more energy to deal with the mold. So it's not about perfection. It's about putting your body in a place where it has the capacity to adapt. If you put a backpack on me and I'm going to go hiking, well, first of all, I want the backpack because I want to go hiking with a backpack so I have water and food and Whatever else that I'm going to take with me, because I'm going to go on a 14 mile hike, I'm not going to do it with just my t-shirt. So if I go and do that, I'm going to add the backpack on. And if it weighs 10, 15 pounds, that's acceptable, right? So having a little mold in your surroundings is okay. It's when you start stacking the plates in there. That's the problem. So I always tell people, yes, mold's everywhere, but it's not about just mold. It's about the amount of mold. And we have to keep it from being that overburdening level and then keep you healthy and strong. Talking about things that keep people healthy and strong, something that comes up a lot that maybe 50% of people are open to, maybe I'm really making that up, maybe 50% of people still aren't completely sure of is parasite talk. And you talk a lot about that. So let's do a quick 101 on how you warm up people to the idea of anyone could really have parasites despite of testing. So my favorite way to talk about this is, do you have animals? A lot of people have animals. I'm like, do you deworm your animals? I'm like, oh yeah. Do they have parasites then? Yeah, they come out. I see them. Okay. Do you live in the same environment as your animal? Yeah. Okay. So what makes you think that you won't get a parasite and they will? Well, the first thing they would tell, well, we don't eat the same food. Okay. What food do you feed them? Well, I feed them, you know, the little squares, like cat food or whatever, dog food. I go, okay, well, that's not super well tested. And we know that there's probably not parasites in there because honestly, animal pellets are more tested than whatever you're eating. I don't care if it's organic or not organic, because if you go to the store and you look at blackberries, an apple, that is not tested for parasites. That little pellet is. So you're more likely with your food to come in contact from food, parasites, than your animal that you're deworming and seeing worms come out of. Also, that animal has those worms is kissing you, loving on you, laying on your floors, laying in your bed maybe, and they're spreading little parasites around for you. If you go outside and touch the dirt or go into water, there are parasites there and you're likely to get them. So it's not if you come into contact with parasites, it's when. And with the when part, it was, was your terrain strong enough to defend you or not? Okay. So 
they're everywhere. And then I just go into the studies. A million people in the United States got diagnosed with Giardia last year. It's a common known parasite. A hundred million people with strongyloides in the world are dealing with that parasite. We know the parasite's around. It's documented. The problem is people just don't want to accept it. And it's not if you're coming into contact, it's when and how strong were you during that period of time. So then people are like, well, then does everybody have a parasite? I'm like, everybody has the potential to have a parasite. We've all ran into them, just like we've all ran into viruses and bacteria. It depends on if your body can defend. And the defense is hydrochloric acid in your stomach, which reduces under stress and it reduces with antacids. It reduces with junky food. So if any of those things are happening in your life, then you're taking the defense mechanism down. And also your next defense line is the bacteria of your gut. And the bacteria of your gut, there are specific bacteria that are actually defense for Giardia or Strongyloides or different other parasites. If you've taken antibiotics and then you've gone and killed some of those. If you don't eat a wide variety of food to feed the different number of bacteria in your body, because let's say you eat the same 10 foods every day, you're actually shrinking your microbiome and making it less defensive because you're not feeding the variety of bacteria in your gut. So that's your second mechanism of defense. So if you know that you've, unfortunately had a lot of antibiotics in your life and maybe don't have the perfect hydrochloric acid for the reasons I mentioned earlier, then you're vulnerable to parasites and they are in your food. I don't care if you cook to well done everything. If you eat a raw vegetable or a raw fruit, there can be parasites on there. I had an Instagram story I posted a few weeks ago that was a blackberry with a little worm running around on it that my cousin who works for me came and showed me. I was like, sweet, I'm gonna take a picture, post that. And then people didn't want to eat blackberries for a while, but they're on our food. It's just part of it. So we just need to accept that they're there and then make our bodies healthy. Let's talk about how people might know that they have symptoms of this. You talked about Giardia, very common. And then if Giardia doesn't get detected, it might crawl up the bile duct, cause some gallbladder issues. Maybe you're not going to digest fat very well, strangle. Like what would be some of these symptoms? Let's talk about common and maybe even less common symptoms people might see if they have parasites. That might kind of flag. So the most common is any sort of GI issue at all. So acid reflux, bloating, cramping, diarrhea, constipation. There are endotoxins that some parasites release that make you constipated. Others that make you flush. So it just depends on the organism. So any gut issue, skin issues, immediately I'm going to be thinking possible parasites. So if you have any sort of rashing, candida yeast that's going throughout your skin, eczema, going to be thinking parasites, grinding teeth headaches, fatigue. These are all common parasite symptoms because they're weighing on your body. If you have pain over your upper left quadrant of your abdomen, which is where your liver and gallbladder are. So if you don't know where that is, find your nipple on your right side, go straight down to the bottom of your rib cage. If there's pain or tightness in that area, there's a likelihood of some sort of toxicity buildup or parasite situation that is affecting those organs. So those are common place ones that I see all the time. Food allergies, especially to dairy, parasite. So hair thinning or brittle nails, dry skin could be a thyroid problem. Or it could be that your, a parasite is affecting your body by decreasing your absorption of nutrients that also leads to a thyroid problem. So those are some really common ones that are right off the top of my head. But then my favorite one to talk about is mental health changes. There are parasites such as toxoplasmosis, which is common with cats, this is why pregnant women are supposed to stay away from cats, that can get into a mouse and run that mouse out in front of a cat to get eaten because its final host that the parasite wants to be in is a cat. So if parasites get into your body, they can cause mental health changes or ways that you think. So you might become more irritable, more anxious, more depressed because they're affecting your brain chemistry through neurotransmitters in your gut. They like to soak up dopamine and serotonin just as much as you do, which make you happy and healthy and excited about life. Let's talk about specifically that brings up nutrients that parasites like to consume of yours, like neurotransmitters, or that's more of a neurochemical, but let's talk about nutrients or maybe even medications that parasites like to eat that keep them kind of thriving in your body because they are very interested in keeping themselves alive. So they're stealing all of the things, all of the resources from you. But let's talk about what some of those might be or some of them that you've seen. So I've definitely seen iron make a shift. So I've seen ferritin go up, which is uh, technically a sign of inflammation. So I've seen iron change. A lot of people end up being anemic when they have parasites. 
So that's probably the most common when I talk about. Some other things that I see is under the stress of having infections, your body releases increased adrenal hormones and that flushes more nutrients. So more minerals like sodium, potassium, magnesium. And then in a hair tissue mineral test, we'll see those lower, which also leads to symptoms like dizziness, standing up, weakness, of course, that correct retention or POTS, dysautonomia, because we're losing mineral content. Other things that I'm seeing is the stress is, is causing epigenetic changes, which leads to B vitamin deficiencies. I can't tell you directly that parasites are stealing those, although they can. I see those things low oftentimes with parasites in the body. Let's talk about, is there any other medications that people take that can really contribute to the continued proliferation or continued life cycles of parasites, do you think? You know, any antibiotics, any antacids are going to be my top one and two because those are the things that make your body vulnerable. I don't know if there's any other ones that are off the top of my head right now. Yeah. Well, you just talked about iron being that can go high and low in the presence of parasites. And this is just top three things I think that there can be a lot of misnomers about would be or conventional to functional medicine would be, I think we all agree on antacids being a nightmare for actually what needs to happen in the gut. You just talked about that earlier a few times, right? Stomach acid is the initial gate and in how this stuff doesn't come in and maybe and populate. I won't go into too many of these, but iron stuff, right? So we see low iron, we just give iron. It can be this kind of self-feeding loop type thing. Let's talk about other heavy metals or other types of toxic burden, but I think mostly metals. What has been your personal experience with metals? What has been your experience with clients? in testing and supporting that. Have you seen metals be a reason people don't clear parasites longer term? I definitely see metal interaction with parasite often. I think that metal toxicity gets, people get on online and start talking about heavy metals being root causes of everything. And that's your primary problem. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily see that. Mm -hmm. However, what I do see is a hair tissue mineral test which is my preference to use for metal testing because it gives you a more of a 90 day look at it versus a urine test. Either you're only going to see what's going in and out right then and there in that like three day period, or if it's not that three day period, then you're not going to see it unless you provoke it. And certain types of provocation like DMSA, DDTA almost always make lead and mercury positive. So I don't love the urine metal testing, but metal is definitely a problem and it's coming from your water supply. It's coming from the genetically modified foods that are now able to grow in places where previously there was too much metal, too much toxin in the, in the ground, and they couldn't actually grow. So now they're growing in more places because of advancement in, in agriculture there. So we're getting more metals into our body. We're also getting it from your shampoos, your makeups, your lipsticks. There was a study that showed 32 different lipsticks. 16 of them had lead in it over the acceptable amount. So we're getting a lot of toxins in and where these toxins come in, the body has to deal with that burden. So the liver, the gallbladder, the kidneys, these are all detox organs have to step their, their game up. They have to find a way to flush those things out using fat, using bile as binders to get the stuff out of your body. So if you can't get it out of your body, then your body has to sequester it. So it has to like put it off to the side so they can deal with it. It'll put it into fat, which then starts making weight gain or weight loss resistance for those people. And then on the other side of that, there's some evidence showing that the body will bring parasites in because parasites love metals and they'll soak up those metals. And then the body, let's say a hundred years ago, because you got the metal from a stream versus all the toxic places we get it now, then wouldn't have gone ahead, used the immune system, cleared out the parasite, gone back to normal functioning. However, now there's an endless supply of toxins. There's an endless supply of metals coming in if you're drinking tap water or doing those other things that I mentioned. So now the parasite's there, it's happy, it's getting metal, and then it replicates. Now you have two and four and six and eight until it becomes overwhelming the body and another burden on itself. So that's why parasites are coming in and becoming more common and staying there. So for me, what I end up doing with clients is I'm like, look, the first step we have to do is we have to make sure you live in a safe place. That includes food, water, air, and hygiene. So we need to make sure those things are safe so you cut off the supply to any sort of reason why your body is unable to remove parasites, the immune system weakened from mold toxicities, things of that nature. So then when we go after the parasites, now they're starved 
out. They, they're no longer getting this reason for being there. Your immune system is back to being strong. And now we can actually have success removing the infections. Talking about safe air, water, et cetera, do you recommend clients automatically get an air purifier? Do you recommend that they automatically test their water or just get a water filter? I mean, it's sometimes, as you know, when you're working on all the holistic health things, it's like a lot, right? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. And not every water filter filters what people have in their water. So I'm just curious how you navigate that with clients. I ask them a question about each one of those things. We start off with air. Have you ever tested your home? If they say no, then we're looking at their organic acid tests, their total toxin burden tests, their labs. And I'm familiar enough after a decade of doing this that if you have certain markers, I'm going to suggest, okay, we need to test the air for mold. So there are direct mold markers, such as mycotoxin tests, where you urinate mycotoxins out. So I'm like, okay, you've got mold coming out. We're testing everywhere that you spend a lot of time. But otherwise, if your mitochondria is suppressed, you have oxalates in your body, you have a methylation issue that looks like your toxic burden is elevated, I'm going to suggest mold toxicity testing there. So I look through your labs to identify if I believe mold might be a problem. I also look at your history. Like, did you move in there? Is that when you got sick? Are there other people in your home that are sick? Do you smell dampness? If that's an issue, we're going to run a test on your home. And then if the test comes back positive, we're going to put together a plan. I don't immediately go to air purification. Because I'm just a black and white guy. I want an answer. I want to know what, what's happening in your home. I don't want to guess because you could put 10 air purifiers in your home. If that house is horrible, it's just horrible. And that's even the 10 air purifiers, although they'll be better, isn't going to be enough for some people. As far as water, if it's water, I'm going to look at ewg.org. I'm going to look at the, the testing for water from the EPA. Even if you don't have water from a municipality because you're on a well, there's probably a municipality around you that was tested. So it's going to tell me a little bit about your ground sources. And I either tell people you're going to do an RO system, which is reverse osmosis. If you have a radioactive element sediment in your groundwater, then we had to do distiller. And that's not only two options. And I just try to make it simple like that. There are tabletop versions of both of those. There's also whole houses for the RO. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to share, I've been living with the same well for maybe 13 years. And I thought, my husband always said, we have this great aquifer underneath of us. And one of my health collapses once upon a time had to do with chlorine and chlorinated water. And so I was just kind of under the impression, like, I've got great water. It's so good. And then I had some epiphanies about my hair turning orange and my iron levels on my HTMA. I'm like, oh my gosh. Our iron levels on our HTMAs are worse than any of my clients, like said to my husband. <laughs> so just when you think things are fine, and I'd done water testing before and nothing was remarkable and it just didn't dawn on me. It just did not click that, oh, this iron coming in via my water was actually causing a lot of hiccups for me or a lot of barriers to improving my overall terrain that otherwise I was doing all these other things, right? It's like so simple yet can be elusive. So if you think you've reviewed it once, sometimes it's okay to go back and just curiously evaluate that again. You talked about HTMA. For me, practice has become a little bit of a game on how, not in a negative way, but how much testing do I need to do to get the same results, right? I'm sure mm -hmm. you've been there as well. Like after you've been practicing for a while, I don't really want you to spend a bajillion dollars on testing because there are some issues with testing. So a couple things. I want to make sure we didn't touch on this. I want to talk about identifying and testing a parasites because we were talking about that and that's the thing that gets kind of tricky. But before we go there, let's talk about the evolution of testing for you in practice. What do you find valuable at this point and less valuable? You've, you've alluded to this a little bit, but for example, I asked you about heavy metals earlier. You talked about how you didn't really like urine tests. You actually preferred HTMA. And there's a whole different pocket of the world that's like, do all this crazy stuff with metals, which I don't really subscribe to either because I always think if something makes you feel real terrible, maybe that's not the best way to do it. So will you talk about your evolution of testing? And then we can talk about parasite testing. Yeah, so I got into practice and I was a muscle tester. So I muscle tested for everything, didn't really run labs. And then I got into blood labs. So I started with the basics, went from there to running more of the, the Lyme testing, blood tests, the uh, hygienics, DNA connections. As more things came into my sphere of clients, I, I had to keep upping my game. So 
as autism and pans came in, I found the neural zoomer from Vibrant America. Their Lyme testing got better. So I started using their Lyme testing. Mold came into my sphere. And I was like, oh, okay, so what do I do about this? So then I looked at all the Rishi Shoemaker blood markers. And I've seen the mycotoxin tests from all the companies. There's three or four out there that are more commonly sought. Metal testing, environmental toxin testing, organic acid testing, HTMA testing, they all came into my sphere. I've seen stool sampling and micronutrient testing and all of those things, hormone testing. And I think they all have a place in time and they're, it's all dependent upon the client and well, first of all, budget, but also complication and what have they done before? Where have they been? So that's the big thing for me is in my evolution is we have a couple options in my clinic. You can see my practitioners jot the order labs first, and then they can really get down to what is very specific for you and needed. For me, because most of the people that I'm seeing are your chronic mast cell, Lyme, been at it, been through the ringer, seen several people. I probably order a little more testing, but that's because the people that I'm seeing have been through everything. Mm -hmm. So I want to run a, a general blood panel now with what I just call a functional medicine blood panel, your thyroid, CBC, CMP, C-reactive proteins, homocysteine, just to get an idea of that. I run the HGMA, which is honestly the cheapest test we run which is nice. It gives me a lot of information about the person within their toxins and how strong their body is and, and able to overcome some of the barriers. Because if you have low minerals, then your body's pretty depleted and we need to, to build those up. And the organic acid test, 76 markers. And I've gotten to the point now where within those 76 markers, I can identify if molds likely, radioactive elements are likely, HTMA covered the metal. So all of those are kind of my three. So a basic blood panel, HT made out. Oh, that's probably where I'm going to start with most people. If I have my way, I love seeing the cotoxin test just because so many people, it's a barrier to get over. Like it's a belief system. Like is mold a problem for me? Whereas even the neural zoomer, which is a test I love for brain inflammation. If you already know you have brain inflammation and you accept that, that's what the test is going to tell me. It's not going to tell me how to fix you. Right. That's how I treat mold testing. It's like, well, do you seem to need some validation? Great. I guess we're going to do this. And I don't know what you're using. I'm using the Vibrant one. I split tested Great Plains and Vibrant with my same urine sample. They were completely different. They were not the same at all. But as I have used them with clients, I feel like I like the results better from Vibrant. It tests more markers. I mean, I really respect Great Plains or whatever they've changed their name to. I can't remember what they've changed their name to, but that's what I'm using. Do you use, are you using urine tests? It sounds like you're doing household testing. I am. I'm doing household testing. So I do Great Plains for the organic acid test, which I think is mm -hmm. phenomenal. Yes. The best organic acid test that I have found. And then I use the Vibrant mycotoxin test, preferably. It is more expensive. Yeah. I figured out why Great Plains was a little off. Vibrant tests smaller particles and the way they do their testing is not affected by supplements. Whereas Great Plains Laboratory, if you're going to do that one, I tend to have people take no supplements whatsoever for several days so that there's no conflict with binders or liver supplements that are going to cause changes in the weight of the mycotoxin as it comes out. And mm, then I also have them do some sort of stimulating thing if need be, such as sauna to help sweat and get mycotoxins mobilized. If you see a HTMA that has low potassium and sodium, and then you notice that their toxin panel, so GPLs is lower, it's because they're not actually moving anything. So nothing's coming out, even though they may have it. So then I, I use some of those factors to then give me the answers on the other side. So if you see low yeah. creatine, then you're not going to see a ton of toxins coming up. Yeah. I think provocation of mycotoxins is the smartest way to go because if I'm using mycotoxin, testing as a validation tool. And I find that your childhood mold exposure can sometimes rear an ugly head in adulthood. Like it just, you sort of, it's like you have an exposure that lives inside of you, just kind of annoys you a little bit, doesn't ruin your life, but just is like, this is kind of obnoxious. And then you get, you have a little bit more of an exposure. Now you are the, I think this is an overstatement, but canary in the coal mine, maybe like it's like, it affects you more. That was me. That was definitely my story. Like, oh, grew up in a moldy basement. <laughs> And then as I had a small exposure, I was like, oh, I'm having fungal symptoms. Like, what the hell? Not to mention my hair is sky high, right? So I was feeding the fungus stuff. So anyway, thanks for decoding the Vibrant versus Great Plains lab thing. Very interesting.
I'm glad you did the work for that and told me the answer. Appreciate that a lot. <laughs> when you tested for Lyme with your provider, was it positive? Because that can be a tricky one as well to get positive, right? Like sometimes the mold, so test, the um, Lyme test. Part of the reason why I went to him. It's part of the reason I went to Alan is he's a muscle tester. Oh yeah. And when Lyme comes around, it's like you need to be able to muscle test. So that's why I went to him, and that's how he was able to find mine. Because the technology that we have now at Vibrant America and seeing some of those Lyme tests just wasn't around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you think that Vibrant's Lyme test actually picks up some older Lyme at this point? I do. I'm seeing it positive a lot with people that symptomatically and history-wise it fits in lines with way more than others. And I've seen some of the specificity studies showing that they've actually now has the most specific one. Igenix is still good. DNA connection is still good. But if I have my choice, it's been vibrant. What about now that you're working virtually? Well, it sounds like maybe you're just using this test if you feel like you need to know Lyme. But if you're working virtually and you're not able to muscle test, it sounds like you would have to either figure it out via questioning or testing, right? How are you overcoming not being able to muscle test now that you're virtual? So there's such things as remote muscle testing, which I've done. I'm also running labs, case history. And honestly, at this point, it's been a decade. I just talk to people anymore and I'm like, oh, I just went out to dinner and you were, you know, somebody's friend. And I'm like, hmm, should we tell them what's going on? Mm -hmm. It's just that, that experience factor at this point, because people tell you what's going on with them if you listen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You said you started with muscle testing. My training also started with t muscle testing with chiropractors before I kind of found a bunch of other stuff. And then you started doing other testing. Maybe you didn't depart from muscle testing. It sounds like maybe you still use it. I was going to ask you if you departed from it from a certain reason, or is it just curiosity and you wanted to learn more and try different things? I wanted to add value to my clients beyond muscle testing. I love it, but not everybody is a proponent of muscle. They, they need more. They need that white sheet of paper that says positive on it. So I wanted to create that, but I also, I get a lot of referrals from medical doctors that I've gotten their patients better than I don't know them at all from anyone else. They were the pain in the butt client to that medical doctor. And because I ran all the labs and they went from positive to negative and there's proof there and I'm bridging the gap between functional medicine and muscle testing yeah. and Western medicine, we're changing hearts and minds a little bit. We're showing proof. We're showing that it's working. I always tell people, because they ask me, like, how long until you're going to rerun my labs? Like, well, I usually like to leave it in about six months because I want to make sure that things are making some changes. And if you're doing really well, then I'll leave it up to you if you want to run those tests. But I want to run those tests because it just proves what we did worked. And I can continue to stockpile positive results mm -hmm. that is making for a case of what we're doing here. So that's part of the reason why I started adding a lot more labs was to be able to bridge that gap, and then also help clients with their families and understanding what's going on. The other part was within the organic acid test and the hair test specifically, it gives me a ton of information that I may not have known to ask. So as a muscle tester, you're only going to get the answer that you asked for, right? So you're only going to get the answer to a question that you asked. That's a better way to say that. So if I didn't ask the question, are you depleted in chromium? I'm not going to get it. And I wouldn't know to ask that unless I ran a hair test because there's infinite numbers of questions you can ask. And those labs helped take me down rabbit holes I didn't know to look for. And I started seeing patterns within, say, the oak test, like mitochondrial dysfunction and methylation, toxic exposure, markers being off, glutathione being low, oxalates being elevated, that all correlate to mold. And I may not have known to look into all of those things specifically to mold had I not start seeing the pattern, positive mold problem, and all those things being off. Yeah. Also, one more thing about muscle testing. Well, the way I learned it, it can be impacted by the clinician doing it, right? So in a way, it can be subjectively affected, even though it should, in theory, be a very <laughs> process based on the health of the overall practitioner, kind of what's going on for them. Would you say that is true or not so much? Or how do you feel about it? I'm actually teaching uh, a new practitioner in my office, so I'm trying to make sure to teach her in the appropriate way. I said, you're only going to get an answer to the question that you ask. So if your mind is somewhere else and you're muscle testing and you're not doing it appropriately and you're not paying attention to the body, then you're going to potentially miss what you're doing. So if I ask a question to you just verbally right now, and I leave it with too much to be interpreted, 
and I'm interpreting your long answer as a yes or no, it's not going to be right. So with muscle testing, you have to know what you're doing, just like lab interpretations. You have to know what you're doing. What I've seen is sloppy muscle testers, mm -hmm. just like sloppy people in any other career. If you're not paying attention to what you're doing, if you're not focused on that, you're going to get bad information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. Now, even if I have Lyme disease and I'm not doing well, but I'm very focused on you in that moment, I can get good answers. Mm -hmm. I just have to make sure that what I'm doing is correct. Mm -hmm. We're talking about testing. We didn't touch too much on parasite testing. So can we bridge that gap a little bit between symptoms and testing and inadequacies in testing? How do you help people know they have parasites? And then second question related to this is that people ask all the time is, should I automatically do a parasite protocol? And I usually tell people it depends on if you're symptomatic instead of just like throwing something aggressive at your body all the time, unless you've never done it. <laughs> but that's kind of my thought. I'm just curious what you think. Yeah. So when it comes to Parasite testing, this is one of those ones that it's really hard for me to spend the money on. The best ones out there are stool samples. They're just not done well. They are not looking for a large variety of parasites. First of all, they're testing like one or two, maybe 10 on maybe the best one. So it's just, there's not enough variety of testing being done there. And beyond that, uh, they're looking for ovum or egg in most cases. They're not looking for body parts or any of the rest of that. And it's done by a technician that gets about 15 minutes to do the, the plate test. And then they move on uh, from that one and microscope to the next one. So it's just not good. So I don't run a lot of testing there. I look for eosinophils being elevated, iron being an issue, liver markers being off. So I'm looking for more signs. And then I'm looking for symptoms than I am for positive lab tests. So yeah, that's my situation when it comes to parasites and testing. You mentioned one other thing, and I'm Almost done here, I think. I think I might have come to the end of the questions finally for today. But you mentioned earlier when we were talking about training, you talked about methylation burden. This comes up a lot, right? There's a lot of it's a very popular topic online. Sometimes people come in and with the freak out question, like, I have a snip of MTHFR. So I need to do these things. And for me, my brain kind of gets frustrated with this topic because why I'm annoyed with it is shouldn't we be able to live a life without supplementation? In theory, so often people find out they have an, an issue with MTHFR methylation and then their supplementation, which I respect and use, but people will automatically be put on methylation supplements and just be told that they're going to be on these forever. What's your stance around this? I'm stuck somewhere in the middle. I don't love genetic yeah. testing because I believe lots of times we can get, we can overcome it by getting well. And I don't actually have a number for this, but we talk about MTHFR and Compton, a few other genes as being methylation genes. Those are the common ones that are on your testing. There used to be a thousand genetic markers that they would test for. They got rid of it because we didn't know what most of them did. And some of them would upregulate methylation, some would downregulate it. Right. So it's all within balance within the body. So what I do is I run a test. I go, okay, is your homocysteine off? Are we absorbing cobalt in our hair test? What's much more like as it look like in the urine based on a test that I'm already running? So they're already there. If I see that that's off, then I'm like, okay, I'm going to put you on a methyl B for now. We're going to get you healthy because right now you're deficient of that. Once I get you healthy, we're going to pull you off of it. So when you're symptom-free, we're pulling you off of that. We're going to be off of it for probably, I don't know, three, four months. I'm going to retest to see if simply the Bs have corrected, meaning they've stayed well or not. And if they go out of range, by coming off of the B12, then okay, maybe you do need to be on that. And out of all the people that test MTHFR and say they need to be on methyl supplements and so on, like one out of a hundred actually need to stay on it lifetime long versus just while their body is suppressed due to the stressors that we've talked about throughout this whole podcast are being dealt with. Yeah, for sure. Well, we covered quite a bit today in a roundabout kind of way. We started with your story. We talked about mold. We talked about toxic burden. We talked about terrain a lot and optimizing mitochondria and how you can become resilient. You can have immune resilience faster. Talked a little bit about heavy metal and tox burden testing and other testing that you like to use. A little about HTMA, muscle testing, parasite stuff. Anything else you feel like you want to leave people with for today? After talking about all of that, all I have to say is if all of a sudden now you're panicked because there's too many things in your mind, all of it can be overcome. There's systematic ways to just get your body healthy and then you can stay healthy. I had Lyme. 
I was miserable. I feel great now. I love working out and going out and having fun. And I don't have to live perfect to live well. Mm-hmm. But you have to still take care of yourself. So yeah. whatever you hear today that resonates with you, take steps forward, move into health, and just enjoy life. I you can't was, overcome this. That was my favorite thing. That was my favorite one-liner. I don't have to live perfect to live well. And I would agree with that because our perfectionist kind of kills. It's like, if this is stressing you out, it's circumventing <laughs> the mm-hmm. entire point of it. Where can people find you online? I have all the socials at Dr. Jabin Moore. And then my website's also Dr. Jabin Moore. And we're putting out free content constantly. And if you need a, a doc to help you out, just book a discovery call. We can help you. Cool. Well, thanks for coming on today and to be continued on maybe a little deep dive on Lyme in the future. Absolutely. Let's do it. Sharing and reviewing this podcast is the best way to help us succeed with our mission to help integrate the best of East and West and empower you to raise the bar on your health story. Just go to reviewthispodcast.com forward slash less stressed life. That's reviewthispodcast.com forward slash less stressed life. And you'll be taken directly to a page where you can insert your review and hit post.